Today, I'm going to talk about controlling acidosis in feedlot cattle. In the United States, we work primarily with corn as our energy source in feedlot diets. And so this talk is going to focus largely on corn digestibility. One of the things I want to explain starting off is the whole corn is the only grain that can be fed in its whole unprocessed form and be acceptable in feedlot diets. Smaller grains like sorghum, barley, wheat need to be broken down because the grain particle is so small that the cattle may not break it apart. However, with whole corn, the animal chews it, especially young animals under two years of age, chew it so that by the time the corn hits the rumen, it is already approximately 50% broken. So it is the same as if we had fed that animal a coarsely ground corn. And there's a great deal of research to support this over a long period of time. However, in feedlots, we do feed some roughage or forage in the diet. The reason that we feed 4-H or forage in the diet is so that it increases salivation. We get a buffering effect from the saliva. However, forage that we feed should be less than two inches long. The optimal length is actually closer to one and a half inches long. One thing to keep in mind in the Eastern United States where we are using bedding is that if we use straw as a bedding or even corn stalks as a bedding, the cattle when they are bedded will consume the straw. It is related to nutritional boredom. And if you throw straw in there, they're going to chew it. If that straw is long stemmed rather than shocked, it's going to have a negative impact on the grain digestibility for that day and potentially the next day. So when we are bedding cattle, it's important to remember that it is better to bed every day or every other day than it is to bed twice a week. It's much better to bed with lesser amount more often because the cattle, as I said, will consume the straw that is used as bedding. An important thing that we need to understand is that when we do add some fiber in a diet late in the feeding period, it may result in an increase in intake versus diets that have no fiber in them. That small amount of fiber, 10 to 15% of the diet, should result in an increase in average daily gain and an increase in feed efficiency and the primary reason for this is that the rumen papillae stay healthier and stay longer. And those papillae are what absorb the volatile fatty acids that are produced by the digestion of the grain by the bacteria. Work done in the early 2000s looked at steam flake corn diets and what they were really looking at was form of fiber in a diet they looked at chopped alfalfa, chopped Sudan hay, wheat straw, or cottonseed hulls. And what they found was that the effect of the roughage source on net energy gain intake was directly related of the NDF concentration of the roughage. So if you had wheat straw that has twice the NDF level of alfalfa hay, you only need to feed half as much of it to get the same benefit. So if we look at a starch granule, it's comprised of starch, fiber, protein, oil, and phosphorus. Most of the starch is on the inside of the, the corn grain and the bran and the germ are the primary areas of protein. So when we look at grains ranked by their rate of ruminal starch digestion, the smaller grains are the most rapidly digested. And that is not because of the size of the grain as much as it is the starch particles within the grain. The smaller the grain, the smaller the starch particles within that. And starch is a crystalline structure. So if it's ground or chewed, 
it breaks apart, creating a lot of surface area. And we need to understand that bacteria digest by attaching to a feed particle. So when we create more surface area, we create a situation where we get a faster starch digestion. If we look at the slower digested forms of grain, dry whole corn is near the bottom. And the importance of this is ideally we're going to have starch digested over a long period of time rather than immediately because we're trying to prevent acidosis. So this would be a typical feed intake and ruminal pH pattern. And at eight o'clock on the left hand side would be when feeding occurs as the cattle consume feed and the feed goes down, so does ruminal pH. And in proper situation, the ruminal pH should not get below a five, even on a high grain diet. However, subacute acidosis happens when cattle overeat one day, undereat the next, and then overeat. And when they are over consuming food because they're hungry because of poor bunk management, the pH can go down to as low as four or four and a half. Now we under, need to understand that pH is on a negative log scale. So a pH of seven is neutral. A pH of six has 10 times more acid units than a pH of seven. A pH of five has 100 times more acid units than a pH of seven because there's 10 going from seven to six multiplied by 10 going from six to five. So while the numbers not may look that different, the impact from a metabolic standpoint is huge. We want to keep that ruminal pH somewhere around a five and a half to a six on a high grain diet so that we prevent acidosis. <clears throat> I want to look at the impact of very low fiber diets on highly processed grain diets. And these are the rumen contents that came from a steer that was fed a completely pelleted diet. There, you can see in this, there is no fiber. The danger of not having any fiber in the diet that can really um, make the rumen papillae healthier is that the papillae clump. If you look on the left-hand side of this, you'll see that the papillae are clumped together. It almost looks like a carpet. On the right-hand side, you'll see papillae with some spacing between them, and they're really supposed to be open because if the sides of the papillae are clogged or they are matted together, what we're doing is we are reducing the area of blood flow that can absorb VFAs and take them to the liver where they're converted into um, glucose for energy or converted into fat for the animal. This is a picture um, of some of the papillae in that steer that you saw from a diet that had no long fiber in it at all. And by long, I mean over an inch to two inches. They lick each other. If you walk into a barn and you see your cattle licking each other and the backs are very wet, what you will often find is that they're licking because they're deprived of fiber. And the problem is that when this hair gets into the rumen, if you've ever had an ingrown hair and, and you get a small abscess from that ingrown hair, the same thing happens in the rumen of cattle. And that can let bacteria um, get out of the rumen, and actually this is one of the causes of um, liver damage and leading to liver abscesses. So bunk management and diet formulation are really critical here. In these animals that have very little fiber in their diet, when they lick each other, they actually get hairballs. And on the right-hand side, we cut a hairball in half. It was very hard. Um, that hair is tightly compacted. 
those things are as dense as a baseball. And um, if you see that in a packing plant, you know that the animals have not had enough fiber throughout their life because they're licking each other, creating hairballs. So in many cases, we do do some sort of grain processing and, and we always mix our cattle feeds. And there are six factors that go into feed mixing characteristics. It's the particle size, the particle shape, the bulk density, the water retaining capacity, the electrostatic charge, and the adhesiveness of particles. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about here a little bit is the fact that when we mix feeds together, what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize separation in the mixer so that we get as uniform a feed as we can in the feed bunk. But the flip side of this is the type of grind that we use on corn is really critically important. So what grind of corn is best? Here I've taken some pictures and whole shelled corn is good up to 10 to 15% fiber in the diet. With young calves under a year of age, you can go up to maybe 20% fiber because young calves chew their feed and, and break apart the corn much more efficiently than older animals. If you've ever watched cows eat corn that are mature, they gulp, young calves chew. On the right-hand side, you see coarsely cracked corn. Um, this is good between 10 to 30% fiber in the diet. That's equivalent to the picture on the left-hand side here. If we get to the right-hand side, that would be acceptable at 30 to 40%. If you, have, if you are going to grind your corn and you're feeding, say, a corn silage-based diet and you want to grind corn, you can do it, and this would be acceptable. I would rather see this at 30% of the diet than 40, because that's getting very small and you risk acidosis. However, a lot of people feed grain that small. These two pictures show grain that has been highly overprocessed. And what I want you to understand is that these two pictures here, and the two pictures here came from a grinder that was set at exactly the same setting. And one of the important things when you are grinding corn, processing corn in any way, you have to keep an eye on it because you can have your grinder set the exact same way. And what you'll find is that if corn has been dried in the field excessively, to get it down to 12 to 14% moisture, what happens is that starch is a crystalline structure and it shatters. And the shattering of corn during processing is one of the things that creates acidosis in cattle. So if we are looking at corn size, a very coarsely cracked corn looks to have about the same thickness as steam flake corn. So why does steam flake corn result in greater gain and efficiency than ground corn? When we steam flake the corn, I want you to see that the particles are much more uniform. And the heat and the pressure during the steam creates gelatinization of that corn particle. That makes that corn particle much more adhesive to other feeds. There is less separation in the feed bunk. And when there is less separation in the feed bunk, there is less of a chance for overeating or undereating with the creation of acidosis. The problem with grinding corn is the amount of small particles that we get. So if you are looking at your cattle and you are walking your cattle pens, one of the easiest way to look is to see what percentage of the manure you see in the pen 
actually looks normal versus abnormal. The picture on the left is normal if a lot of fiber is fed. But in our feedlot diets where, fe where we are feeding a lot of starch, there is not as much fiber to hold the manure pack together. And so what you see is that it, it doesn't stand up. And the picture on the right-hand side here is actually normal if not a lot of fiber is fed. However, we start running into trouble with these two pictures. If you see things that look like mucus streaks in the manure, that's actually the lining of the intestine. And that means that that animal's under a great deal of stress because that intestine is, this mucus is a high protein product. And when you start to see mucus there, that is an indication that the lining of that intestine is sloughing away and that animal's under a great deal of stress. If you see water pooling in there, they have severe diarrhea. And the main thing with this is bunk management or mixing or both are culprits. Those are, that comes from cattle that are being underfed one day and overfed the other day or where we're having so much competition that the aggressive cattle are eat, overeating and we're not managing our bunks properly. And this is the situation we want to avoid. Cattle that are fed in outside lots, if you see them eating dirt, this is called pica. It's an abnormal condition. Cattle that are under severe stress from acidosis will eat the dirt, even in a um, bedded barn with a dirt floor, if you see holes, that's an indication that you have a big problem. This came from a feedlot with the worst case of pica that I've ever been in. So let me spend a few minutes and talk about acidosis. It occurs primarily with highly processed grain diets. What you have is you have a decrease in the rumen protozoa and you have an increase in a bacterial species called Streptococcus bovis. Now that Streptococcus bovis has a generation time of around six minutes. And the way bacteria reproduce is by dividing. So their division time is about six minutes. Most of the normal starch digesting bacteria have a generation time of about 30 minutes to an hour. So the problem with Streptococcus bovis is it produces a lot of lactic acid. And when lactic acid builds up, it builds up in the blood and we get a decrease in rumination. We get a lower rumen pH, we get a lower blood pH. And when we get a low blood pH, we get constriction of blood vessels. This is the same lactic acid that you get if you are not used to exercising and, and you run and you get a Charlie horse cramp in your leg. That's from a localized buildup of lactic acid and the constriction that's occurring. So that constriction can kill cattle because that esophagus can constrict and that's what bloat is. Bloat is a byproduct of the, this acidosis. With acute acidosis, you'll see cattle hanging their head. They'll be listless. You can see anorexia. They'll often have diarrhea. If you do a blood bicarbonate test, you'll see that there's lower blood bicarbonate and greater acid, which causes the constriction. And then, um, after this occurs, you will often see bloat. Bloat is a byproduct of the acidosis. And what actually happens in bloat is the esophagus constricts. The gas cannot be released because that esophagus is constricted. The left side of the body wall extends. And when we have this situation, that animal's going to die in many cases if it's not 
treated properly. We can get anatomical defects that prevent the re release of fermentation gases. And the one thing that I would say here, people that use a stomach tube need to be very careful because at the bottom of that esophagus, between the esophagus and that rumen reticulum, there is a valve down there. And that valve is what opens and closes to allow the release of gases and to allow the inflow of, of feed. Well, the problem is, let's say that you have a stomach tube and it has sharp edges and you push it down through that valve. What's going to happen is that's going to create some swelling of the valve. And so with chronic bloaters, often our attempts to relieve the bloat actually may create a situation where a little bit of swelling of that valve actually makes the problem much worse. So if I'm trying to prevent bloat, the most important thing that I can do is actually bunk management. Um, there are treatments. If you have pasture bloat, there is bloat guard or paloxylene. Um, it works to break up the frothiness that occurs with some pasture bloats. Some people will drench with fats and oils. It may break up the froth if it is a frothy bloat. The problem with that is that bacteria digest feed by attaching. And if you pour fat and oil into that rumen that is never supposed to have more than six to 8% total fat, what you do is you may impair rumen function for two or three days and you'll actually create diarrhea. In extreme cases, a trocar is used to punch through the side of the rumen I would have a veterinarian do this. It's done in extreme cases to save the life of the animal. So how do we prevent acidosis? We increase the frequency of feeding. We can increase the roughage in the diet. And keep in mind that the best roughages to have in a diet are ground down to one and a half to two inches. We can feed complementary grain sources, such as a mix of whole shelled corn and coarsely ground corn. It is a thing that can be done. More importantly, we can have gradual diet adaptation going from a receiving diet to a growing diet and from a growing diet to a finishing diet. We don't just want to increase them Immediately, we take a 10 to 14 day period. And usually when I am increasing the energy content by increasing the percentage of grain, I may also decrease feed intake by an equivalent amount of energy. So I may take feed intake down a pound a day and hold it for two or three days before I add more grain. So because as I add more grain to a diet, especially if I'm coming off a haylage diet or a corn silage diet, and I'm going to add whole shelled corn to that diet or even ground corn, as I increase the energy density of the diet, I reduce intake so that what happens is I get into a situation where I'm keeping the actual energy the animal gets on an equivalent basis. I can also utilize some products that minimize the effect of lactic acid producing organisms. And I show you once again that the speed with which starch is digested slows down when we have grains that do not need to be processed uh, in order to be fed. And that's a really critical thing the other thing that we can do is, and probably the most important thing we do, is we control feed delivery. If we are starting cattle on feed and we predict the amount that they're going to eat, we, we control feed delivery. Um, I like prescription intake or restricted feeding. 
in situations where I'm starting cattle on feed because it reduces human error. The worst thing we can do is push cattle too hard when they're going on to a grain diet. Um, we want to reduce feed wastage. We want to reduce metabolic disorders. Um, it can be used to reduce fat content and um, that may be a positive or a negative, but when I say controlling feed delivery, there are cases where we can feed only 90% of predicted feed intake and actually the feed goes through the digestive tract slower so the animals are more efficient. So I wanna talk now about feed bunk management because in practical terms, it's the most important operation in the feedlot. And the objectives are to maximize animal performance, to minimize digestive disorders, and to keep animals eating a consistent amount of feed. I use basically a four point feed bunk scoring system where zero, zero has no feed remaining in the bunk, one half has some scattered feed present, one has a thin layer of feed across the bottom, typically about one kernel thickness deep. A two might have 25 to 50% of the feeding from the previous day remaining. Three would have a crown of feed. And four, we would see virtually no feed touched. So here's pictures. Um, the score of zero on the left-hand side, if you're familiar with the term slick bunk management, the slick comes from that spot uh, in the center of that feed bunk where cattle are actually licking the bottom of the feed bunk. If I see this for more than two days in a row, I increase feed intake by 5%. I don't make increases of over 5% to 10% in any situation, I try to keep it at five. If I could get to a situation where the entire feeding period, I could get my feed bunks to look like the score on the right with a half, I would keep my cattle eating a consistent amount of feed and may not alter it for as long as they can do this. I like to see scores of one half three to four days a week in practice. That lets me know that there are kernels there. If the cattle that are not as aggressive um, want to come up and eat, they can, they can get feed, but it also lets me know that my really aggressive cattle um, do not have excess feed there to overconsume because very often the cattle that bloat and die are the aggressive eaters. If I see bunks that look like this with a score of one or two, I know that I am overfeeding them. Um, there is a huge disconnect between the way dairy cows are fed and beef feedlot animals are fed. And you have to remember that in a dairy diet where many people are taught to keep feed in front of animals at all time, um, they'd prefer to see a feed bunk that looked like one or two. But when you consider that if I have haylage versus I have corn, that haylage has half the energy density of corn, and it's also only half as digestible as corn. So when you combine those two things, if I have a pound of haylage and a pound of corn, I'm getting four times more energy delivered to that animal with the corn than I am with the haylage or, or hay. And that's because it's got twice the digestibility and twice the energy density, and you multiply those. So when we're feeding high grain diets, I am less concerned with feed intake and increasing it than I am with managing the cattle so that they are consuming the same amount of feed every day and reducing my variation. Research done at South Dakota State University looked at yearling steers and they looked at two types of feeding systems. 
Lot A steers were fed using slick bunk management where the steers were fed to only eat what they would eat in the 24 hour period. Lot B steers were fed so that feed was always available. The results of this are that the steers in lot A had a dry matter intake of approximately 20 pounds or nine kilograms, which was the same as the cattle that had ad libitum intake. However, the cattle that were controlled in their feed intake, having that bunk score of zero to one half, gained three and a half pounds a day versus the cattle that had ad libitum intake where they only gained two pounds a day. Well, you may ask, well, if you have the same feed intake, why would the cattle that were on a controlled intake gaining nearly twice as much? And if I look at my feed efficiency, it took 5.4 pounds of feed per pound to gain controlling intake versus 9.4 pounds of feed per pound of gain when feed was always available. And this shocks many people that you can use 76% less feed by controlling intake in this one trial, at least. And here's why. The top picture, lot A, where I have a consistent amount of feed, it worked out to be about 20 pounds a day on average over this 55 day period shown here. Well, the important thing to understand is that an animal a steer that has about 80% of total daily intake goes for maintenance. So only about 20% of the feed intake actually goes to average daily gain. And so what we have here is if I have 80% of 20 is 16 pounds, after the cattle were started on feed for the first two days, they were eating in excess of that 16 pound maintenance requirement the entire time. Now what happens when feed is always available is that if you look at where 16 pounds would be here, probably 40% of the time, the animals did not eat to meet their maintenance requirements. And so you can ask yourself why? Well, these fluctuations in intake or what we call the yo-yo effect. And the days that they eat less than their maintenance, you're destroying feed efficiency because they're not gaining or they're gaining very little, but yet they're eating that day's worth of feed. And so we always want cattle eating in excess of maintenance. And the reason bunk management works is that there is competition. And when you have some competition, when the feed truck drives by, the cattle start to get up and they start to come to eat. If that feed is available all the time, you're not doing any bunk management at all. You might as well have a self feeder and your efficiencies and your average daily gain are not as good and the cattle have a lot more metabolic stress. So <clears throat> why was efficiency of feed utilization for gain improved with bunk management? Well, it goes to something called the hierarchy of nutrient use, which goes maintenance, development, growth. Now we don't worry too much about lactation and reproduction in a feedlot, but they're shown in order and then fattening. And we have to understand that in feedlot steers, as much as 70 to 80% of feed intake is used for maintenance, leaving only 20 to 30% for growth. So why was feed efficiency better with bunk management? As I said, competition causes them to come to the bunk. Weather patterns don't intake feed, don't impact feed intake nearly as much because it's competition that has them there. So we level out those rainy days, those cold days, those exceptionally hot days, that's controlled much better when there's competition. 
and those cattle will almost always eat in excess of their maintenance requirements. There are also feed additives that we can use to improve performance and reduce acidosis. In conventional feedlots, the most common ionophore is rumensin. The active ingredient is menensin. It is a, a feed grade antibiotic technically, although it is not absorbed by the animal. And it is the most common type of, it is the most common um, product used in commercial feedlots. If I am feeding for an all natural program, I may feed Amifirm to increase ruminal lactate utilization. Amifirm causes the bacteria that utilize lactate to increase in percentage. Remensin causes a shift in the bacterial population to produce less lactate. We also, as I have said, we can use proper bunk management and we minimize our fluctuations in feed intake. We also have to understand that bedding is a major source of the fluctuations in confinement cattle if we're only bedding twice a week because when they eat the bedding, they're not going to go to the feed bunk. So in an ideal situation, if I'm using bedding, I'm chopping it, I'm blowing it into a pan or having it processed in a bale that I put in a pan, it's going to be no more than three to five inches long. And I'm going to go in there and bed every day, every other day, so that the animals eat less of that straw because when it's put down, they're going to, to tramp it in to the bed pack. The other thing I want you to understand is that acidosis leads to hoof lesions. This is a picture of a really badly swollen foot taken at a packing plant. It indicates chronic acidosis from improper bunk management resulting from feed intake fluctuations. When we get a reduction in rumen pH with excess lactic acid, we get constriction of the capillaries. When that happens, laminitis occurs because there's not appropriate blood flow. So this animal had to be in pain from laminitis when an animal has this situation. It's under stress, it walks less, it eats less, it will have a reduced average daily gain and a reduced feed efficiency. It's really important also to keep a look on the hooves of animals in the feedlot to see how we're doing because you can see the swollen feet, you can see the long toes, and those animals will have laminitis, which indicates that we have mismanaged the bunks leading to the acidosis. If we are going to use products in these feedlot diets, Remensin is the most common for commercial situations. Amifirm works exceptionally well in all natural situations. In a commercial situation, the benefit of Remensin is that it reduces feed intake. And one of the things it does, it actually reduces the amount eaten at any one meal, but it increases the number of meals and that helps to prevent an overload of grain at any one time so that we get a reduction in acidosis. So feed intake is reduced, they gain the same efficiencies increased. With Amifirm, we do not see a decrease in, in feed intake. We see either equal feed intake or maybe a slight increase. We should get an increase in gain and that increases feed efficiency. If I look at a menensin for a commercial feedlot, I want to explain the mode of action. Um, they inhibit the growth of gram-positive rumen bacteria. Gram-positive bacteria are the primary bacteria that produce lactic acid from Streptococcus bovis. 
they work by not allowing adequate passage of ions through the cell membranes of gram-positive bacteria. The gram-negative bacteria produce much more propionate, which is one of the other reasons that we get an increase in feed efficiency because that propionate is converted to glucose in the liver. So in feedlot diets, if I have menensin in a commercial feedlot, I may get a decrease in feed intake, but they eat smaller meals and that helps to stop overeating at any one meal. The effects on energy metabolism are that I get an increased proportion of propionic acid from the gram-negative bacteria, a decrease in acetic and butyric acid that go to back fat and seam fat. It also results in less methane production, less heat of fermentation, an increased efficiency of energy utilization due to, to sparing carbon that goes to propionic acid and it spares amino acids no, normally used for gluconeogenesis. However, if you're feeding for an all-natural market, many of them do not allow the use of ionophores. I use a lot of amiferm in feedlot situations. It's been shown to increase the growth rate of not only fiber digesters, but lactate utilizing bacteria, and that's the primary reason that I use it in all natural feeding situations. It leads to a stabilization of rumen pH and that stabilization of rumen pH is what allows them um, to consume more. It keeps cattle healthy by reducing the metabolic stress from lactic acid associated with high grain diets. I did research and when I was at Ohio State looking at Amifirm supplementation with some research sponsored by NCBA. Um, in one experiment, Amifirm resulted in a 4.9% greater feed efficiency in a sheep study where we used ground corn and a cattle study where we were using a 76% dry corn feedlot diet with 10% corn silage we saw a 7.2% improvement in feed efficiency, and it took 4.8 pounds of feed per pound of gain. They gained 3.77 pounds per day, and they had a finish weight of 1,228 pounds. So these were Angus-based cattle. Um, my thoughts are that if we use good bunk management, we can feed cattle for all natural markets and get exceptional performance. So my final thoughts on acidosis is that it's largely preventable with proper bunk management, with controlling feed particle size, and with forage levels in the diet that match the grind level and the particle size of the grain. We can use manure to evaluate if some cattle have digestive issues, it's only one diagnosis tool, but it requires that we walk the pens and we should be doing that. We need to understand that nervous cattle are more susceptible to acidosis than calm cattle, so disposition is important. And if we are really underfeeding a pen of cattle, you will see a lot of nervous cattle and you will see really aggressive eaters staying at the feed bunk because there, there is not enough competition and they have the opportunity to overeat and they will. So improper bunk management, feed delivery and overly processed grains are the most common causes of acidosis. Thank you.